as we move into this time of sharing, I ask you to pray alongside with me. Oh, gracious and holy one, the mystery is real. We cannot always see out that far in front of us. And yet today you invite us to see what is right up close through you. Through this scripture and through the legacy of Thomas, help us to have a new inroads, knowing that our doubts can be used for an ever strengthening faith. We long, O oh Lord, to hear your words, peace be with you, and to feel it in every ounce of our beings. May it be so. Amen. Dear friends, I am with you this morning here uh, with a beautiful gift that was originally from Shelby Williams, who is Oliver's mom. Uh, he is a play, play friend to my son Jay in the nursery, and you probably have had the chance to meet Shelby and Steve. And we were talking, she likes to bake so very much, and uh, we were talking about the fact that we don't have any yeast at my house. I don't know about you, but the little packets are in short supply all over Maryland. And she said, well, you know, you can begin with a sourdough starter. And so she gave me uh, the instructions, a two page instructions about how it is to follow along and do a sourdough starter. Now, I don't know if this is something that you've ever done. It is not something that I have attempted. And I have my doubts, I'm dubious about it. Sure, you put in some water and some flour and eventually you're gonna be able to make something as seemingly complex as bread itself. And so I knew just the person for the job. It was not, not me, <laughs> it was my husband, uh, in part because he is so steady and faithful. When he has a task like that, he is attentive to it. And with a beauty, he can come every day with a faithfulness and a responsibility to do just what you have to do. Because you need a whole week, friends. You need a whole week of feeding the starter and cutting off the piece that is uh, what would be cut away in order to add something new and to keep allowing it to feed upon itself. It's, you have to come to the fact that you've just got goo fermenting. You've got it either put it on your counter or you put it in the fridge eventually. But for that week's time, you have to have patience. You have to have a sense of what it means to wait into something that can't fully be seen. I think it feels a little bit uh, connectional to the basic elements of the story that we're having today because this is a time and a place in which they knew what it was to have to have yeast on hand all the time. We know that the little packets are not something that they would have been attentive to or known in Jesus's time. And I'd like to think that as they would have needed their daily bread when they're sequestered like that, that somehow, somewhere, someone was tending to the yeast, even in these tough times. Someone is bringing food either out on the doorstep or somehow they're in a structure and a configuration somewhere with a kitchen that someone is tending to what it is that they might eat and how it is that they might live, especially because they think that life itself indeed may just be over. Jesus appears to them in the locked room because he believes in them, the gooey possibility of what might still be started in their midst. We might think that it's just flour and dough, a couple of ingredients, some disciples who have gone rogue, those who have doubted and disappeared at times. But Jesus sees more and comes to see more through their boundaries, through those locked rooms. He sees before them, before himself, what the disciples are. They are a sourdough starter. They've got all the potential ingredients for the habitation of the spirit to be put forth. And we know that it is through them that we will find the ability of Jesus's resurrection not to be a one-time thing but that through the disciples, we will find that rising happens again and again. I like that a pastor I'd read about had put it that uh, for a living, God rises. God rises for a living. If we were to write a job description of what it is that our God and our spirit does, resurrection is fundamental to that. It's the basics. It's a God who indeed rises for a living. 
And he's calling in to them, those disciples and the vocational aspect of their living and saying, you are being ready for something more up that is happening will be a key part of the ingredient of what is to come. And I like to think that it is Thomas, the one who gets a bad name, the one who is the doubter. It's his enzymes that help to spark the fuel of the bread, the leaven, that which will be needed in the time ahead. Because all the disciples are in their places of doubting, just as we would be friends. All of the disciples have their doubts. They crave the assurance that the one who had died before them, that even as they see this appearance, the body before them now, they want to be assured that it is the same one who was with them then, who is now with them again. And we know that Jesus is the same and he's not the same. And so he goes about proving to them that he is who he says he is. For all along, that was his goal throughout his ministry. I am the Messiah. I am who I say I am. I am who I profess to be. I am here with you now. As he breathes the breath of life, they call this John's Pentecost moment, because here Jesus is breathing peace into them, breathing life into them. He believes that they are capable of rising up, of co-creating alongside the job that God does the resurrection for a living. It's not a one-time event, but the starter is going to be taking root in the disciples and who they will become and venturing to say that they will provide the environment for God's resurrection. In the parable, we know this through different means as Jesus would preach that this is the good soil that God would be looking for. That this is the ears to hear and the eyes to see that God would be needing before the message of hope can go forward. Their favorable environment means that this gooey habitat of awkwardness, of uncertainty, of being locked away is about to create a favorable condition in which indeed the spirit would breathe and indeed new bread would be brought about for the world. But doubt, my friends, is a necessary ingredient. Doubt's going to agitate the materials to life for us. The questioning reveals chemical properties and verifies for us that something new is happening and we are not just seeing things. We know that yeast has been important over the years and theoretically it could just go on for a lifetime, but it has to keep being fed. So it is with our faith, friends. Without the doubt to agitate, we atrophy. And we don't have the alive sense of that bread that is worth passing on and worth getting deeper into and the kneading of our hands, worth sharing with the world and the vibrancy of a God that is rising again and again. Writer Anne Lamott offers us an important definition of doubt. The opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. Faith invites us to believe into things that stretch our human form. In a time as it is, when we are supposedly absent of all the certain things, the school schedules, the exercise, the livelihoods, relationships, travel, when all of this is strained or suspended, we are left with less pretense and security. I wanna show you a slide that I'd seen passed on through some friends that was originally posted by a woman named Rachel Rohde. It shows Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Perhaps you've seen it if you've had therapeutic instruction or even medical training. It's a basic understanding for the things that we need in life and how it is that we might evolve over time if all of our needs are continually being met. I was drawn to this slide because I hear a lot of folks, and maybe you're among them, I know that I put myself in this category at different times over the last couple weeks, is a desire to be very much at the top, to self-actualize, to be coming into a new hobby, and to doing things just right, to maybe be a new virtuoso, and to find that you can thrive and uh, lean into your creativity in just the right way. 
that the rigidity of our previous routines don't seem to fit into this new reality. We can't be the virtuosos we might wish to be. In my case, we can't even hang up the curtain rods that we bought six months ago and put them in the bedroom. We can't seem to squeeze out the right time for something new. On this hierarchy of needs, you'll see here at the bottom, food, water, air, shelter, sleep, biological basics. And then right above that, safety and security. As we feel more safe and secure, we see that love and belonging are there next. And I think, especially those of us who know the importance of community as those early disciples did, I think that we try to toggle back and forth a bit, knowing that we need the belonging and yearning for it and showing for, up for it on Zoom and worship. And then also facing the realities that we're back in the places of our security and safety especially if we choose to tune into the news and have a sense of what's out there. Or if we go to the store and are looking for the necessities and can't find the yeast or we can't find the toilet paper, we worry. And that puts us back in a place where our minds and hearts can only exist in this sense of, I need to take care of the elementals. But I also like to think that because we know this, because we could imagine and give ourselves over to the fact that the arrow points downward, we are here, then we might have more grace with ourselves. We might have more grace with ourselves that we're not at the top of the pyramid. None of the disciples were at the top of the pyramid. So, so recently after this new revelation of his death, of Jesus's death, and we weeks, not even months, too many months yet into this time of new experience that the self-actualization wouldn't be necessarily required of us either. What is the basic meeting of our needs? What is it that we need to know of Jesus's presence? For Thomas, he's very upfront in the need for his empirical evidence. Everybody else had seen it, all those other doubters and the disciples. Maybe Thomas was out off on a run just to get a breath of fresh air when he happened to miss Jesus. And now he's back yearning for the same reality they would have seen. Maybe you have friends of this nature who are trying to understand a little bit more about what it means to form community. And you might share with them, I've been going to worship with my church. And there's an inkling of an interest of those who would also like to see the living nature of a God whose job is resurrection. And you bring them in to the place where you know it can be found in community in the starter community that keeps on bubbling up we're able to take a, and siphon off a little bit of what we have in our resources just as you do with that initial starter and you dedicate it to something new and then what's still here has an essence in the beauty of christ and it would keep on starting and the faith would keep on going and our doubts as we bring them to this safe space the doubts not only of the theological and the intellectual as we would go more up the ladder but the basic things the places in which you doubt whether you're going to have what you need the doubt that you have about whether your health is going to be maintained you can bring it to the safe space of church the safe starting space that we have that was the initial locked room the safe space where it's not about a packet of yeast. It's about this living, growing, gooey thing that has such potential. And we need Thomas. We need Thomas and his doubts because it was the week long of that fermentation that the disciples originally got to do. But now with Thomas, he lets us in on this moment when we are ready to break off to cut that first initial place of the starter that will make bread. It's going to make bread, friends. It's too rich. It's too full of the chemistry of life not to. And he invites us in our basic needs in that moment to see the basic thing we need to see, which is to know that Jesus is who he says he is. That God is who God promises to be. That resurrection 
is what God does for a living. The baker of our lives. And we, in our desire to believe, have to keep giving ourselves over to the starting process. The pandemic brings us back to the basics, brings us back to the basement of the pyramid. And we may have doubts and questions. Am I who I say I am? Is my faith what it needs to be to get me through this thing? And the answer again and again is with Thomas. For after peace is breathed, Jesus is in front of him. And we aren't told that he then, Thomas, needs to touch after that. But he did need to see. Just like we need to see each other in this platform or, or hear each other in this platform, that Jesus there in the context of community, there beautifully with Thomas is revealed to us again, the reality that resurrection is the living of God and is ours to participate in. Now we have to pay attention to the admonishment that Jesus offers after that. He says, oh goodness, wouldn't it be great if you could see, you wouldn't have to see in order to believe. But that's the hierarchy of needs that's come along through John's writing too. In the gospel, as he writes it many years after the life of Jesus, all of the people who've heard this story aren't eyewitnesses. And so in their times in which their basic needs have been met and they can breathe and think higher and into greater places of being, they need to trust in the count that has come down before them. We put ourselves in this camp and have high expectations about us being able to believe even though we don't see. Sometimes we try to make things so very certain when Anne Lamont reminds us that the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. When we get it too locked in, when we believe that this little packet of yeast is all that we need, we forget the dynamic nature of the gospel that meets us in pandemic. We forget the dynamic nature of what we are called to do out of that basic wellspring of God's resurrection. And so I dare to say, friends, that it's not Jesus's voice about us seeing, needing to see in order to believe. It's we're going back into crisis time. We're in Thomas's words and in Thomas's world, and we want the empirical evidence. As close to us is the goo that we have in a jar that God is chemically, powerfully alive and doing something that will feed us for this time and then through the magical, seemingly properties of the mysterious elements of yeast could feed generations and theoretically feed people for all time. Bread, friends. Bread's about coming from flour and water. And God's peace comes to us through the beautiful blowing of the breath of God and our doubt coming together to create something beautiful and deep and rich. And together we can feel its properties taking shape even in these tough times. Now, I wrote the other day in my KC Weekly about running in the rain. I'm reminded of it again this morning with the rain out, and I talked about not having the energy to cry, and I think some of you were worried about me. And I think some of you were worried that the uh, tasks of parenting have become too much, or maybe you saw in your own life in the ways in which you feel overwhelmed. That was my intent, friend. It's to be honest with you about the vulnerabilities of this time. It's about being honest about the times in which we sometimes need to cry in order to let go and let space for the new chemical things that are happening. It's about walking and running down to a gully over here by the golf course and coming up on these huge cabbage leaves in which I felt the expansion and love of God's billowing creation. I think of Laura's song of the ocean, of allowing the peace to enter into these spaces in which we previously felt locked, where we feel sequestered in our homes, 
that the love and ocean and flow of God's love would be with us. The sourdough starter is a reminder, even as I see it bubbling right now, that that interactive time of resurrection is for all times. I want to encourage you that when you need to run figuratively or truthfully in the rain that you do so. I want you to give yourselves over to the fact that you may not be a virtuoso in this time. You might not have the most organized closet ever, and you might not be become the best seeming version of yourself. But in the raw elements of who you are, can you recognize God within you? Can you recognize the ways in which Jesus he says he is as he shows up to your mouth? Can you recognize the ways in which you are being prepared like the disciples as a starter, as a community, to be siphoned off as necessary for the loaves that might be baked for the DNA from Church of the Savior and from 50 years of being planted in Colombia, that that DNA that's wrapped up with God is worthy and baking, whether we can give every ounce of who we think we need to be in this moment or not. The bread is going to be baked. Just like Carol Dunleavy's loaves that are in the freezer are going to be accessible to us. And just like this gooey substance, this starter, we will be ready for the time to come. In a few moments, Alan's going to offer a community prayer. I'm so encouraged that so many of you sent in your prayers to him. In the future, we're going to find out how it is that we can best do some community response, because I know we love to hear each other's voices, especially as we might hear each other doubting actively. It gives us hope about our faith and deepens our lives together. And so we kind of have to rely on this, this unknown way to continue to open ourselves but I hope that as you hear those community prayers prayed and as we would hear beautiful song again from Laura inviting us into the depth of our pain and our joys, that we would trust that the breath of peace is continuing to be offered by our living God. I just wanna close with this mask that my son had made this week. You can see it, it's a tiger or a lion, it's a lion. <laughs> he wouldn't like if I got that wrong. And we were talking about how we needed to make a mask for his class in order for them to show, to be seen, to allow them to see it. And I was struck that day. It was so hard. It was like living with a little lion cub that day. And I looked for so many different ways in which the peace of God would enter in. And I remember the passages of our scripture that talk about the lion lying down with the lamb. I think that's what happens when the chemical properties coalesce, friends. When our doubts, as important as they are to the structure and jungle of our lives, when the doubts can be alongside the peace. Peace doesn't dispel all the doubts, but they certainly, the peace can enliven them and make them just the right enzymes alongside Thomas for the bread that will be necessary, dynamic and beautiful, of resurrection. I just want to end by sharing what you might already know, what the sign language uh, sign is for Jesus. It reminds us of Thomas's encounter and the reality that even in his changed form, Jesus, his dead body, had come to life. You take the dominant finger from your dominant hand and you touch the interior of your non-dominant hand and then take it back. I like that this not only tells us about the holes, what Thomas and the others wanted to see in order to believe, but it requires a rising up of our fingers in order to display what it is that Jesus and God continue to do. These are the same hands, friends, that are needed for needing. May we know our strength as it comes when we're vulnerable, when we give it over, when we have our doubts, when we come to community and we testify to the living reality of our God.